A couple of years before the outbreak of World War II, Imperial Airways launched its legendary Empire flying boat service to Africa. Three times a week, one of these sumptuous aircraft traveled all the way from Alexandria in Egypt to the Cape. It carried 17 passengers in standards of country house comfort still talked about today, and its mail service was the bond that held the British Empire together. Try this, it's got kick, it's not slow, you can't stick, you must go. This is the rhythm for me. This beat, it's got style, it's got heat, you must smile, it's complete. It's just the rhythm for me. We've had enough of Charleston beating. This rhythm has got central heating. Just think, it's got these, it's got those. And who knows, this is the rhythm, the only rhythm, this is the rhythm for me. By any standards, the trip was an extraordinary event. As a child of nine, I traveled on one of the Empire flying boats, the Coriolanus, from Sydney to the Fiji Islands. It was one of those childhood experiences that leave an indelible mark on the man. Flying Port Catalina, Flying Port Catalina, Flying Port Catalina, this Port Alexandria. You receive, please? Catalina, Chile, Chile, Victor, requesting clearance to land in the harbor. Now, 40 years on, another flying boat has appeared in Egyptian skies. It, too, has been drawn to attempt the celebrated imperial route south. I am equally drawn. For me, flying boats and Africa make an irresistible combination. Shukrun. No bacon? The Empire's passengers before embarkation traditionally breakfasted on bacon and eggs at Alexandria's Cecil Hotel. They would have found the notion of a Muslim ban on bacon unthinkable. Neither the plane nor its pilot have been to Africa before. This will be a proving flight to see whether the old route can still thread its way through the realities of modern Africa. And with a film crew, I'm going along to find out. The first sighting produces mixed feelings. This, the last African flying boat, an American-built wartime Catalina, looks unexpectedly small out there among the ships, frail as a dragonfly and terribly, well, old. My fellow passenger, Alexandrian doctor Adam Nakib, also once flew on an Empire boat, traveling home after taking his degree at Cambridge. The plane's French owner, Pierre Journet, has been running African safaris for years. This is his boldest enterprise to date. 
Recently, he bought his American pilot, Jim Ladegard, and the plane on a 15-hour trip across the Atlantic with Canadian Oliver Evans in the navigator's seat. Pierre plans to run air cruises down the old imperial route. It's a business venture and it must succeed. Pierre is an entrepreneur, a taker of risks. Jim is a pilot trained to minimize or avoid risks. Pierre knows nothing about airplanes and Jim knows nothing about Africa. This Catalina is 45 years old. Of the 3,000 built during the war, only 70 are still airworthy. Pierre found this one abandoned in Canada with birds nesting in it. A plane needs more than a mile to get airborne, but once aloft, has the stamina of an albatross. The Mediterranean slips away behind. The next salt water we're due to see is the Indian Ocean, 3,000 miles away to the south. The post-revolution Alexandria we're leaving is not the same city in which Dr. Nakib was born. That was presided over by the debauched King Farouk and a rich, self-indulgent ruling class accustomed to living high on the hog. It was a city used to scandal. Dr. Nakib himself ran off with Farouk's wife the last queen of Egypt. Very tasty. Very tasty. It was a very decadent society, beautifully decadent, you know. It had to end, but before it ended, it had to live. He remains one of the heroes of Egypt's revolution. He founded its National Health Service, but he retains vivid memories of the old Alexandria. Well, you're invited to a dinner which, uh, which you have, uh, that very bourgeois thing, caviar and champagne, you know, and... Uh, uh, Omar, <laughs> That's bourgeois. Very bourgeois, of course. And after a nice dinner, a very uh, sophisticated conversation, a lovely lady, for example, would come and sit on the knees of uh, uh, a man. And uh, he would dally with her. He asked one of the attendants to pass him the large scissors. And he was start snipping away bits of her expensive dress while she giggled. Until slowly he snipped up her figure, her person, until the thing fell off. He cut the dress off her? Off her. While she giggled, very amused and delighted. What do you think ordinary Egyptians would have made of that kind of occurrence? What any normal human beings would have done, they would have been disgusted and uh, done something about it, and I think they did. Uh, so the, the revolution was inevitable? I think it should have been. We happened to be in a position to do that sort of thing, and we paid the price fully, fortunately. And we survived it. I remember distinctly landing on the Nile and uh, there would be a, a motorboat waiting for me, of course, especially. <laughs> sorry, I have to say this. Sorry. This is sent, sent by King Farouk? Uh, no, no, no. My father would be in it and I, I, would, uh, I would land on that. Uh, please forgive me for being so immodest. I mean, it's part of my nature. The flying boats which called here at Cairo were state-of-the-art machines, the last word in aviation technology.
They were the China tea clippers of their day, craft of consummate grace and elegance. And they were conceived not for prosperous, privileged passengers, but to carry letters bearing a humble penny halfpenny stamp. When Parliament approved the Empire Mail Scheme, it ordained that a letter could be sent to any part of the British Empire for the price of a cup of tea. Imperial Airways won the contract. From Short Brothers of Rochester, they ordered 28 revolutionary new planes, sight unseen and straight off the drawing board. They were built by shipwrights and launched down tallow-smeared slipways into the River Medway. The Empire Mail Service was as much a political flourish as a social service, a gesture of solidarity from the mother country to its colonies and dominions far away. We have more mail is unloading. Let us for Cairo, Port Said, Ishmaelia, Suez, Luxor, Aswan. The letters which the flying boat has brought close the lonely distances that separate people and countries. News from England, only two days old. Details of serious events in Dorset or in Lincolnshire. Baby has a tooth and the cat has kittens. The temperature on Tuesday was nearly 80. The Imperial Airways passengers, travelling through an Egypt still heavily influenced by the British, enjoyed privileged rites of passage, progressing down the Nile as effortlessly as migrating swallows. For us, though, Cairo was a compulsory stop. We could go no further until we had collected official permissions for water landings in Upper Egypt. After months of negotiations, however, the paperwork seemed less than complete. Almenia, no, no, I don't know exactly. I shall take the last uh, information now for, with the telephone. And Aswan, okay? Aswan, okay. Abu Simbel? Abu Simbel, okay. Everything, okay. Okay, we're we'll starting engine. The ancient Egyptians believed the world was created out of a chaos that always threatened to overwhelm it, embodied today by one of the most impenetrable bureaucracies on earth. We face three more days in their airspace. Jim stays low, just as Imperial's pilots did as they showed off Egypt's treasures to their customers. But they did so with an eye on the dashboard clock, keeping to a timetable as immutable as that of a Swiss train. As the flying boat leaves Cairo, she passes close to the pyramid. For 60 centuries, men have looked up at them as a great monument of the ancient world. Today, men can gaze down on them from the windows of the newest triumph of the modern world. Passengers enjoyed five-star service and five-course meals eaten off the best china.
There was a smoking cabin, fold-down beds, a stand-up bar, and a promenade deck. It was the ultimate grand tour, 30 style, conducted from the vantage point of an airborne cruise liner. Herodotus called Egypt the gift of the Nile, and away from its banks, Egypt effectively ceases to exist. There's nothing there. Near the river, though, there is life, renewal, growth, continuity. It is the highway we shall follow. We're heading for the city of Aswan, where the Nile, locked by a great dam, is suddenly transformed into a vast man-made inland sea. Last one, it's Juliet, Charlie Victor. Charlie Fox, Juliet, Charlie Victor, go ahead, sir. Roger, sir, I'd like to land on the water above the high dam. Can you please uh, uh, say, where did you uh, get this permission from when? We had obtained permission from Cairo before we had left to land on the high dam. Yes, sir. Uh, there is no permission uh, for you to land at this uh, place. Please uh, report final on my three pass. Okay, let's get a clearance going into the airport, I guess, right? I'm going to haul these pins on as well. Okay. Charlie Brooks, Charlie, Charlie Brooks, I'm going to Cairo now. Circling over Lake Nasser, Jim grew impatient awaiting a decision, and Pierre agreed to let him come down at Abu Simbel. This Catalina is amphibious, and now we prepared for our first dry landing. Sometimes, you know, it's uh, too difficult well, to get the permission like that. You should prepare yourself in Cairo before you no, go. We, we, yeah, we have the permission in Cairo. We, we were, we are. They told from us the in Egyptian Cairo. Air Defenses? Yes, yeah. they told us in Cairo you have the permission. So we have the permission from Defense. We have this paper. We have the permission for the high dam. So what is the problem? You know, we don't, we don't understand anymore what's going on. Uh, we're going to be landing just short of the dam, which is just outside of the military zone. No, the serious is you will appear in the Mediterranean raiders of air defenses. And that means and we don't that want to be shot. Are you yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, you should have a Mediterranean number from the Egyptian air defenses. A number? Number, yes. That number means that uh, if you fly over the high dam, you will never get bombed. OK. Well, I think we'll just go off as quickly as we can now and uh, go to S1, make a phone call. And okay. we should be... Yeah. God will be with you. Good luck. Shukran Jazila. Assalamu alaikum. I pray for you. <laughs> Beaten by the bureaucrats, we doubled back to another dry landing at Aswan, and a famous old hotel perched beside the first cataract. The Aga Khan often stayed here, yes. so did Agatha Christie, who was said to have written Death on the Nile in one of the suites. Would you care for some tea? I'd love some. It's also one of Dr. Nakib's favorite retreats, and this is where we'll leave him. Imperial's passengers stayed here too. They ate dinner, explored the souk, and if they had any sense, got to bed early. Their pilots notoriously like to get away at the crack of dawn. I'm beginning to suspect that Africa isn't going to appeal to Jim. He's going to see it as just a lot of strange places held together by red tape, where the beer's no good and nothing works. Thank you. 
Pierre will be selling his passengers a flying boat cruise and they'll be expecting a water landing at Aswan. After many telephone calls, he finally gets the plane onto the Nile, anchored beside a village a few miles downstream. Yeah, Catalina. Catalina. Flying boat. boat. It's a boat. Yeah, the real police is all right. Catalina. Catalina. Flying The Catalina, when we reached it, was dripping oil. This engine, a reconditioned Pratt & Whitney, was obtained from the Papua New Guinea Air Force, the other one from a man in Zimbabwe. Little, little parts we carry a lot on board, and uh, even up to spare pistons, cylinders, and plugs, and lots of uh, all the pumps, the fuel pumps, hydraulic pumps, all that we carry. And Jim can change that in, in a couple of hours, probably, but um, if it came to an engine. Jim, fortunately, is also a qualified Catalina mechanic. Our dependence on this taciturn man, I'm beginning to realize, is absolute. Without Jim, we don't move. Oliver can't actually fly the plane. Only Jim can do that, and only Jim can cajole it when it doesn't want to fly. The ancient Egyptians believed the sky was so insecure it had to be propped on four pillars to stop it falling. How secure will we be up there? Destination is Khartoum in Sudan. I say again Khartoum. That's affirmative and just check we will not be landing. Jim's relationship with this aircraft, which he's not flown before, is that of a cowboy doggedly breaking in a troublesome horse. With Egypt behind us and the real Africa ahead, Pierre's spirits are starting to lift. Now we're going around along the Nile for a while, down to the third cataract. From there we'll cross across the uh, Nubia Desert to the fourth cataract, and from there on to Khartoum. Presumably the flying boats had to have alternate water landings yeah. all the way down, so they couldn't have gone too far from the river, could they? That's right. We have the possibility of landing on the land as well, so we are quite um, lucky in that sense. We're following the Imperial route almost exactly, never straying too far from the Nile. I'm drifting along in a crystal pavilion, watching the Nubian desert slip by at a stately 85 miles an hour. Over the fourth cataract, Pierre urges Jim lower and lower. I see one crocodile yet. Oh, that noise. Uh, we've got a noise coming out of this engine here. I don't know what it is. Is that an eye? Yeah, I think it's still going. 
Looks like we're sticking the power out of it anyway. We've taken a bird strike. We've run into a flock of something, though we're not sure what. Sacred ibises, someone says, though it could be anything. But damage has been done. We get the hell out of here. How far we got to go to the nearest airstrip? 10 miles or 15 miles away. How far the car come? I've got another 170. Yeah, let's take it down. All right. Without consulting Pierre, Jim goes for an emergency landing. The nearest strip is at Meroe in the Sedan. Ironically, the Nile at Meroe was listed in Imperial's handbook as an emergency port of call. Jim? Jim? I think we just have a cow yeah. yeah. flat that was coming loose. Yeah. Jim is still not talking. Pierre's discomfort, I sense, covers a growing irritation with his uncommunicative pilot. We couldn't have got onto cartoon with the, the cowling like that. As for me, I'm far more concerned about the state of the engine than Jim's lack of social graces. It's the second time he's had to fix it today, and if he wants to do so in silence, that's okay by me. In Khartoum, it's Juliet Charlie Victor requesting information regarding Khartoum Airport. Is it open at this time? Over. Roger, continuing inbound, we're estimating Khartoum at time 1416. There are 150 words for wine in Arabic poetry, but the Arab religion forbids even a taste. We're now in the Islamic Republic of the Sudan, a country as dry as its own dusty landscapes. I just checked, uh, people will be landing on the river at Chizera. I say again. Khartoum stands at the confluence of the two Niles. The blue runs down from the barren wilderness of the Ethiopian plateau, the white from Burundi, 1,500 miles away in tropical Africa. We've landed at Gordon's Tree, named for the old hero of Khartoum, and also Imperial's original flying boat depot. Yeah, it used to be a guest house where they used to, uh, used to uh, welcome the passengers yeah. and do the custom and immigration formalities. Well, I can't see that, but that's behind the oh, trees. It's just behind, in those trees there, yeah. Right, right. We've got a bit of a welcoming committee tonight. It's good to be here. In place of the irritation and suspicion we often felt in Egypt, we find only the famed Sudanese friendliness. And we, we were on the ground about half an hour. Yeah. Fixed it, Jim fixed it, and uh, we took off again. I'm sure. But we lost about. I'm sure. <laughs> we lost about three quarters of an hour. Through here. I'm fine. And just as they did in the old days, the authorities have erected a special customs and immigration tent for the flying boat. The formalities are observed, but in a relaxed Sudanese manner. Yes, he's on this uh, form here, Mr. Freighter. Alexander, Alexander Russell Freighter, Australian passport. 
This strikes a chord, the sleepy splash of water, a flying boat riding quietly at anchor. It's a scene from my childhood. The next leg promises to be a tough one, and Jim must get the boat shipshape again. That bird strike has left us with a few dents. It's a long way from Spokane, back home in the shadow of the Rockies, and Jim, accustomed to well-stocked hardware stores with fast checkouts, doesn't quite know what to make of this medieval soup. Does anybody speak English? No. Does he speak English? No. Why does no English. English. French? Body move, hot take? No. Mm. Do you have any hose clamps? No. <laughs> uh, mm. It's similar. Put it on. Put another one on. Clamp. No, that's a that's a valve. Clamp. Uh, hmm. <laughs> Do you have a screwdriver? Do you know what a screwdriver is? It's a drink with orange juice in it and vodka. <laughs> you got paint. Yeah, paint. Need some white paint. White. There are few foreigners in Khartoum. Those who live here, mostly aid workers, try and conjure up a kind of normality by holding weekly regattas at the Khartoum Sailing Club. Their clubhouse is one of the elderly British gunboats which brought Lord Kitchener and a young war correspondent named Winston Churchill to avenge the death of General Gordon, cut down by the Mahdi's Islamic hordes. Today, the wheel has come full circle. The infidel armies have long since gone, and the Mahdi's descendants once again control their own Islamic destiny. What's it feel like coming ashore after a hard afternoon sailing and being stuck with this stuff? Uh, it's very tough. Is it? You feel deprived? <laughs> very. <laughs> but now Islam's fundamentalism is being challenged by other Sudanese in the south, many of them Christian. A bitter civil war is being fought with very sophisticated weapons, and our next leg takes us right over the top of it. Bill Cragg, an English pilot working for a local charter company, lord of a small manor in Lincolnshire, came here to pay off death duties on his estate back home. It was considered one of the most beautiful spots in the world, and you can see it when you go there, the old Juba Hotel, the swimming pools, the squash courts, the gorgeous semi-tropical vegetation around, lovely climate, the Nile flowing by. Captain Cragg regularly flies supplies to Juba, now caught up in the dangerous crossfire of the war. Um, and you go there now, the last time I was there, there was no electricity in town at all. There was no water. There is still massive starvation. Right. Um, there is still enormous people amounts of people dying down there. There's enormous amount of fear. I think fear is the main thing I see in the people down there. How does it, uh, how does all this affect your emotions? I mean, uh, terribly, yeah. terribly. Um, a complete emotional battering. I think like many men, I tend to be, think of myself as a big, rough, macho, rugby playing type of fellow. And then I see myself reduced to tears by a small child lying there starving to death and dying while I'm watching him. But uh, our help probably is more useful in the form of manpower. You can't just keep sending in food and thinking your conscience is clear. What, what, what's going to happen to these people in 20 years' time and 30 years' time? We burn 80 gallons an hour in flight, and since there's no fuel at Juba, we need enough to take us on to the next Imperial stop at Kazumu on Lake Victoria, at least 10 hours flying time away. This man helped refuel the Imperial boats with a hose and pump that haven't been needed since. Oh, there's feathers in it. 
feathers in the hose and there's feathers in the pump. I want to take that pump apart and clean it up. Yeah, the only way you do it is to clean the pump out and the hose and everything. Now, keep your height if you decide to go down there because this is all an area of rebel activity. Yeah. They are equipped with SAM 7s. Come over Jubarit at least 10,000 feet between you and the ground. Mm -hmm. And then keep within the town limits, within the town limits, small circles all the way down, right? Okay. The rebels are reputed to be on the eastern side of the river. And it is tiger country over here. It really is. So keep across to the west, over the town. Same on takeoff. My advice to you is if you can't, get up there with adequate time to give you adequate fuel onto your next place. Mm. I think you're really going to have to think again. People have tried going, going in and out low, and uh, at Malakal, two aircraft were shot down trying to do that. Our alternate idea was if we can't go through this and get fuel and go on down to where we want to go, Lake Victoria, we'd take the alternate route and cut across this area over here. Oh, I see. And into Lake Turkana. Uh, right up here. What's that area like? Very hilly. Navigation very difficult. Um, you've just got to fly track and heading and ground speed. Yeah. Try and judge it and just lay off for that and just fly time. Yeah. Yeah, the classical time and distance, I suppose, as the pilots used to do in the old days. Right back to basic original Mark I eyeball and navigation. Mm -hmm. You're a lucky man having the chance to do it. Now we're making our first diversion from the Imperial route, following a southeasterly track that should bring us out to Lake Turkana in northern Kenya. We climb to a healthy 13,000 feet, well above the operational ceiling of the SAM-7 missiles. But the air is very thin, and Oliver needs oxygen to aid his concentration. The navigation is not going well, few radio beacons are dead, the charts don't make any sense, and nobody answers our radio calls. We're chasing shadows and the world below is full of them. Clouds, hills, trees, and to my mind, hostile forces. The only certain thing is that we are still over SPLA rebel territory. After six hours of solitude, there is sudden activity on the flight deck. Someone is talking to us. It's a flying doctor down in Kenya. She's on her way to Lake Turkana too and tells us about a sheltered bay where we can land. She also promises to make smoke to guide us in. Dr. Anne Spurry, our good Samaritan, has flown in from Nairobi for one of her regular clinics with the El Molo tribe, directly descended from the first humans who inhabited this corner of Africa. Dr. Spurry is French, one of the pioneers of the Kenyan Flying Doctor Service. She's 70 years old, but aims to continue her work for as long as she can keep her pilot's license. One of the conditions she treats here is stress, handing out phenobarbitone to help people sleep. Life on the lake is hard.
Coming down at this remote and desolate place gives us a taste of what it must have been like for the pioneer pilots on the East African route. They first demonstrated the importance of the aeroplane in a country where communities were separated by huge distances. Those funny old flying machines rewrote the most basic physical laws. Suddenly, it was possible to shrink those distances, to bring those communities closer, even to save lives. Now, people like Dr. Spurry do that routinely. After our long trek south, the tanks were low. Pierre, putting his insider's knowledge of Africa to good use, winkled some fuel out of a local trader. This extinct volcano stands at exactly zero degrees latitude. We're crossing the line, but there are no celebrations. Everyone is tired. We're now cutting inland to rejoin Imperial's route. The Empire boats shadowed the Nile all the way down to the freshwater ports of Lake Victoria. Captain radios his estimated time of arrival to the wireless station of Kisumu, main air junction of East Africa. As they prepared to land, a highly practiced organization involving hundreds of people swung into action. Airport, ETA 1830. Okay. Kisumu Airport comes to life in readiness. The mail van runs up. The ground staff man the patrol launch. thousand feet above sea level, the airport of Kisumu lies in a sheltered corner of Lake Victoria, the second biggest freshwater lake in the world, as large as Ireland. The flying boat arrives, bringing government officials back from leave, settlers for the farms of Kenya, engineers and doctors coming out for a term of service overseas, and most important of all, letters from home. Where's that bag? Last story. George. The linchpin of each operation was the captain. Those on the African routes were celebrated public figures, perhaps a touch eccentric, but held in such high regard that schoolboys prized their autographs. They could be martinets too, cracking the whip and often getting airborne again in little more than 20 minutes. In the early hours, the flying boat takes off from Lake Victoria for the last 2,500 miles of her journey to South Africa. They were real commanders. They were regarded as uh, ship's captains in every sense of the word. And uh, everybody who was junior to them behaved in a junior way, you know, saluting and everything else went on. And they even had the cap captain's tables at the hotel at Kasumu. Awful old hotel used to be called the Dysentery Arms. <laughs> Peter Colmore, who once worked as Imperial Station Manager at Kazumu, knew the captains well. I simply must tell you a story about the great Captain Dudley Travers. He'd been about an hour out of Kazumu. He'd taken off and he'd leveled out and looking forward to get to the next stop. And the flight clerk suddenly climbed up the aluminium ladder into the cockpit 
and yelled in his ear, and old Dudley had his headphones on, you know, and he's uh, staring away, and these four Pegasus roaring in everybody's ears. And then the flight clerk said to him, I've got news for you, sir. He said, oh, yes, what is it? Lobsters and Corfu for lunch? He said, no, I've left all the fucking passports behind. <laughs> and of course, it was a big left-hand clambering, so the wretched passengers must have been a bit disconcerted, wondering why they were going back. We've spent the night at Lake Naivasha, the old flying boat stop from Nairobi. Imperial's wooden jetty has long gone, along with the brass bell that once summoned passengers to the lake. Something is clearly wrong. After a two mile takeoff attempt, we abort. We are 6,200 feet up on the highest of the Rift Valley lakes, and our two elderly engines simply can't cope with the heat and thin, rarefied air. Jim has never blown a takeoff before. For the first time, the cowboy has been unseated by his troublesome horse. With flying abandoned for the day, we go native. We get ourselves invited to one of the exotic ceremonies held by the tribe who inhabit this lovely corner of Africa. What sets these Africans apart is that most have accounts at Harrods. We are, of course, with the heirs and successors of Kenya's notorious Happy Valley set. So he, he went over and I went there too. <laughs> Once there were more British Aristos here than you could shake a stick at, and it was the Imperial flying boats operating from the lake and allegedly running on champagne that were their direct link with home. We get onto this superb flying boat, huge seats, absolutely marvellous, lots of leg room, and an observation deck up above. And landing here in Naivasha, it was July, so therefore it was green, uh, was a glory. I looked around at this whole scenery around here and I thought, oh, have you landed in heaven? I came for three months and been ever since. <laughs> at the other end of the lake, there was really the uh, Happy Valley set who were still living it up, weren't they, in those days. <laughs> who, who were they? I mean, well, there were big landowners around here. There was um, Sir John Ramsden, who owned all the land from this lake all the way up to Lake Nakuru, just about, and Lord Delamere. Uh, and Lord Errol used to come and Lord, to Yes, he was, but he was, he was dead and gone by 48. Yes. But there was still that lovely house there. Who, who? And Lady Delamere was living there, and she'd married, first of all, uh, Robert Colville, and they bought the Gin Palace. And then later, later she married Lord, Lord Delamere and moved to the next lake oh, right. with the flamingos on it, right. Lake Elementite. Right. Right. What do black Africans make of this? In Naivasha, the races coexist all right, though it was sometimes hard to believe that this was the same country in which the Ma Ma gorillas wrested independence from the whites. Lovely. We seem caught in a strange time warp here. Now, where do we go now? Yes, I mean, what we want to do is make sure that your knee is over his knee. So you're, you've got the, the, the knee over him. Line. Line. It's a very really intimate thing to do to a total stranger. I mean, just they like, love sort of it. Bot, do they? <laughs> no, they love every moment. I don't think you think of it when you're going <laughs> hassling along. Like that. This afternoon, I was watching. Linda and Charles Nightingale, they were rushing down here at great speed, two of them on their own. I thought, oh yes, and the game was over there. 
Several hours later, in the cool, buoyant air of morning, and with only a single cameraman left aboard, the rest of us made our own way to Nairobi, Jim tried again. Nairobi brought me, with relief, back into Africa. Once the well-to-do middle classes in Nairobi were all white, but not anymore. Here the men and women who built the new Kenya occupy the gracious suburban houses once occupied by their colonial masters. I've been invited to lunch by Mishak Ndizi, who, as a young man, was flown on an empire boat to take up a scholarship at Ruskin College, Oxford. What were, the, uh, what were your fellow passengers like? Can, can you, have you any clear memory of them? I have a very, very clear memory of uh, Misha Kandisi. Uh -huh. I was the only African right. aboard that aircraft. It's a pleasant family affair. Esther, his daughter, designs and markets her own textiles. You, you wear so one garment. Roy, his son, has set up his own business as well. He started a small airline. Mishak helped draft the Kenyan constitution, freeing his children from the attitudes traditionally imposed on black Kenyans, attitudes which he took with him on his flight to England. And one thing I remember very vividly is I was uh, booked in, into a hotel, and um, the waiter came, very smartly dressed, and addressed me as, sir, what would you like for breakfast? Well, I also addressed him as, sir, in fact, I think mine had more emphasis than his. <laughs> I was coming from a country where um, we were not supposed to be wearing a hat when talking to a European, you had to hide your hat. When I was at high school, we weren't allowed to wear shoes. So on a Nairobi Saturday, we would be walking in the streets with the very smartly dressed with our blue ties and uh, barefoot. Twenty years after the signing of the Constitution, though, things have changed. Mishak's son Roy and his partner Chris and Jenga have become aggressive young airline executives and owners of a new Cessna twin recently bought in Canada. Roy then donned his captain's stripes and ferried it all the way home to Kenya, a young African explorer passing high above the Arctic wastes. The longest single hop over water would have been about 1,500 miles. And that right. was from the edge of Greenland up to the edge of Iceland. Right. So, what, so what happened in Iceland when, when they saw a black pilot getting out of this aeroplane? I'm very confused. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they've seen many black people there at all. Um, it's a funny little place. I, particularly the town we went to, it's, um, 
the fishing population, mm -hmm. and I don't think they have very much exposure to the outside world. Right. So we had a little man with a camera who kept on going behind pillars and taking photographs <laughs> of us. I think he was probably photographing me. <laughs> The Aero Club at Nairobi's Wilson Airport is one of the last outposts of the boisterous old white self-confidence. Black pilots prefer to drink at a smaller, quieter place down the road. It seems that aviation here still belongs to the children of Kenya's gregarious old flying farmers, and something of that dogged white settler mentality lingers on. To try and break into here, it doesn't matter where you go if you need to buy a spare part on credit, they won't extend credit. Is that right? Um, they just make your life generally very sure. difficult sure. To, to start. And uh, we've had to fight this. They just said, no, no, we're not ready for that. Yeah. And it's actually, we have had to come up and say, no, we're, we're ready, ready for it. Right. And we are there. Most of the companies at Wilson Airport have not seen it over the years really necessary to train. It isn't a long-term thinking. Whilst we can think about it, and go out and say, look, we want trained manpower uh, because we are not only thinking about today, we're thinking about our total future. We're thinking about our children sure. who are going to be here. This is a good moment. Two weeks after leaving the Mediterranean, we've made it down the dusty heart of Africa to the shores of the Indian Ocean. We land at Zanzibar's ancient Dao Harbour, where, once, they shipped in the terrible commodity that made this island rich, slaves. Dr Livingston, who had a house here, called slavery the open sore of the world and fought it relentlessly. For that, he is honoured here today. Zanzibar. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Too. Good yeah, that's some pens. Some pens. Yeah, I'm a writer. You want yes, one? I want one. It's my head. You are. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. 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 Thank you very much. Jim is joined by his wife Sharon, a retired rodeo star. Pierre has flown her out from the States because he's worried that Jim, fed up with Africa, might suddenly jump ship and head off home. Uh, I would like to talk to the manager. She might even, with luck, bring out a new and gregarious gym, a gym who'll mix with the passengers. Beer? No, yes, no. Oh, no, please, yeah. Cold? Cold, yes. Uh, no colder than that. Hot like and cold? cold beer. Cold beer. Yeah. Cold. One very cold beer and two glasses. We're suddenly off the tourist track and a long way from the urbane western civilities of Kenya. People seeing my white face assume I'm a Russian or East European advisor. It's a claustrophobic but fragrant little island even here in the sweaty market, the air is pungent with smells from the clove distillery down by the Dao Harbour. Pierre would like to give his customers the Zanzibar experience, but he's imagining their response to accommodation like this. Very nice. And half window. Could you, could you sometime maybe change that for, for, for windows? Yeah, that's, that's been nice. Yes. And you have a nice view of yeah. He knows that when Americans go on adventure holidays, the adventure must end each day at sundown. Then they want air conditioning and iced martinis. So for us, that would be OK. But for our passengers, we might have a problem. We intend to rehabilitate the whole building and put air conditions in all rooms, and if possible, to have six rooms with self-contained. 
best within our program starting next month. Uh, whether or not you got those clearances for uh, Mozambique and Harare. Yeah, sure. Yeah, no, we just brought that. We have uh, uh, The proving flight is nearly over. In six days, Pierre will be picking up his first passengers at Victoria Falls for the trip north. And he calls a staff meeting to finalize a few details. It's a pity about that Naivasha, Jim. I, I don't know how you feel about it, but I would really like in the future to include... I mean, it's a fantastic place. I'm sure you Once again, his natural optimism runs into Jim's innate sense of caution. And this time, Jim is not in a compromising mood. Now, take off what... How many people would you be happy to, to take off with? I mean... Well, you were there. You know. Yeah. We tried it with four and, you know, some baggage on and everything, and she wouldn't do it. And then we tried it with... No baggage, and a couple yeah. of people, and still it wouldn't go. Fine with the airplane empty, you know. What's the use of having an airplane if you can't haul the people? I don't think it's a usable one for the loads you want to carry. Landing, getting down is no problem. It's getting off the water. The yeah. airplane just right. won't do it at that altitude and the weights you want to go at. So, still leaking oil, we head off on our final stage to the Ilha de Mozambique. It was one of the empire's last stops before South Africa, a tiny, old, glittering city, a kind of jewel box. Pierre, intrigued, has agreed to take me there. But a civil war is raging around the island, and though we have clearance to go in, we have no idea what to expect. The beautiful beaches of Mozambique are empty. Occasionally, we see tank tracks, and when we glimpse people, they run for the cover of the trees. And then we should be of the coast, not overland. Have a few gorillas inland. Right. I should have you. Why is that? Well, there is a war in Mozambique going on. Our insurance only covers us for 10 miles along the, along the coast. And we don't want to be above them. They should have you. They should have aeroplanes. Approaching the government held town of Pemba, we came face to face with the realities of Mozambique's civil war. Army missile bases were ranged along our coastal route, but our radio frequencies didn't match theirs. The Pemba control tower offered us a choice of options. We could either continue down the coast and risk being shot at with our insurance cover intact, or we could divert inland uninsured. We decided to sleep on it. There's a, a no man's zone right in around this We chose area the here. safer inland option, the, the but then a Canadian pilot on a relief mission so warned that the Renamo uh, rebels were a lot more active than well, officials had led us uh, to believe. I didn't, I didn't, I guess mean no man's land. It's a, it's, uh, it's a Renamo land. It's no man for us. <laughs> yeah. You know, right. we don't want to go in there. Yeah. And that would extend but. south pretty well as far as this right here then. The last time I yeah. was in there was like three months ago. Yeah. And so my information then. isn't yeah. current. Right. You know, things are fluid here. They change day to day. Could be hot one day, yeah. could be not the next. I mean, remember, this is Mozambique. It's a country of yeah. war. Everything changes. Wherever you fly in the country, you've got a risk. Yeah. It's mm. acceptable. Yeah. Are they shooting at uh, civil aircraft? Oh, <laughs> they shoot at um, they shoot at, uh, uh, at uh, low-flying aircraft that uh, aren't supposed to be there. Uh, you're talking about Renamo. Mm. Uh, like, both of them will shoot at you. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah, you have to be aware of that. Inland or along the coast, both options looked equally bleak. Even the idea of turning back, now quite appealing, wasn't feasible. With little to choose from, Pierre ordered Jim inland. Ten minutes after takeoff, we ran into the extremities of a tropical cyclone. Jim's instinct was to fly high in case there were any Sam 7s, but Oliver pointed out that if he lost sight of the ground, he wouldn't know where he was. The compromise was to hug the cloud base. My worries about insurance and the starboard engine were overtaken by the nagging thought that someone down there might be watching us through the eyepiece of a missile launcher.
weather worsened, forcing us still lower. Then, all at once, we were there. The tiny Ilia de Mozambique swam into view. A wave of relief ran through the plain. We came down at dusk on the very spot where, half a century earlier, the Imperial flying boats had landed. On the 1st of May, 1939, a Captain Smith, piloting Imperial's Challenger, misjudged his approach while alighting here and crashed, killing his flight clerk and radio officer. The noise coming across the water astonished us. It was like the roar from a football terrace, and many of the cheering, yelling islanders even waded in waist deep to wave to us. Most were refugees from the war, homeless and hungry, and the generosity of their welcome was extraordinarily moving. We became aware that not a single light was showing on the island. Pierre said that cutting power lines was a classic prelude to a guerrilla attack. When the last flying boat landed here, this had been a beautiful, well-ordered little place. The ancient capital of Portugal's African empire, it was founded more than three centuries ago, conceived as a tiny replica of faraway Lisbon. Then, in 1975, the Portuguese suddenly ran away. Threatened by native freedom fighters, they were packed and gone within days, leaving behind their perfectly miniaturized rendering of a great European city. But the euphoria of the young Frelimo government was short-lived. South Africa funded a rebel army to destabilize its Marxist neighbor, and the Ilha de Mozambique found itself cut off. Its economy collapsed, and its fine 17th century townhouses rotted. Now, every time it rains, another falls down. Apathy and inertia hang over this besieged island like a fog. Ironically, these useless old guns are pointed straight at the village of Mozuel, clearly visible across the water, where the Renamo rebels have their headquarters and the staff officers plan their eventual conquest of the island. Most of this landscape is under their control and very little moves here without their say-so. Refugees are arriving all the time, a thousand more within the past two weeks. Room is made for them, nobody complains. The future is something they do not contemplate. The present preoccupies them entirely. Yeah, fish, fish. Eh? The dozen shops have nothing in them and are closed. There isn't enough food to justify the existence of a market, so you get it where you can. How much per kilo this one? 500, guys. Eh? 500. 500? Yeah. How much is 500? One pound, two pound, three pound, four pound, eight pound. There's no work, no water. The guerrillas blew the main some time ago. Only sporadic power and very little hope. This is clearly no place for a vulnerable old flying boat. Pierre knows he cannot return here. We have to take off into the wind, so this area will be very difficult to use because it's not long. So a long area, a 
approximately this long we would need, as long as the island to take off. The tropical cyclone that dogged us earlier is still about, and Jim's anxious to be off. <laughs> It was hard to say goodbye. We seemed, briefly, to have reinstated the island's old links, its access to a world with wider, brighter horizons. Two hours later we departed, waved off by a people who, despite unimaginable hardships and deprivations, had shown us nothing but kindness. The last of the African flying boats leaving the weird little island where the empires once called. Both the island and the empire boats are anachronisms, of course. They're relics of an era when European powers saw nothing strange about constructing sumptuous flying machines for their male and ruling classes, or building gilded replicas of their capitals on tropical mud banks far from home. At the Ilha de Mozambique, the two came together. But to what purpose? Now the Empire boat is extinct, dead as the dodo, while this tiny place rots and festers and in a few years will become just another jungly monument to old European conceits. In a way, Piers Catalina is an even greater anachronism. It can't touch the empire for elegance and luxury, nothing ever will, but it's very old and as close to the real thing as you're likely to get. But in the final analysis, it's an illusion really, a ghost of those great shadows that three times a week, usually on time, passed this way and briefly eclipsed the African sun. <laughs>